Hello and welcome to our Google Hangout for Diabetic Eye Diseases Strengthening Services MOOC. Before I get started, I really want to introduce my uh, wonderful expert panel that's uh, right across the globe. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Anthony Hall, who is in Newcastle in Australia, followed by following the time timelines that we've got. We've got Dr. Kim Ramaswamy in Aravind in Madurai. We've then got wonderful Wanjiku Mathenge in Rwanda at the Institute of Ophthalmology there. And um, we've got Professor Tunde Peter, who should be in Northern Ireland, but is all the way in the US this week. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for joining us from across the globe. So the students and the learners throughout these, um, the MOOC have submitted a few questions, so I thought we'd, we'd do a little bit of a digest of all the questions that are there and cover as many bases as possible. So with your permission, I'd like to get started on these questions. Optical coherence tomography has really transformed <coughs> Islamic practice and really is a powerful tool in the diagnosis of uh, diabetic macular edema. So when there is no OCT in place, what is the best approach, the management of maculopathy? And Shiku, I'd like to perhaps direct that question to you and get us started on, on situations like that. Thank you, Daksha. Um, I think as practitioners today, we tend to forget that there was a time when there was no OCT uh, because it has really changed the management of diabetic macular edema. But uh, I would say that we need to remember the basics. Without an OCT, it's important to start with a good visual acuity testing. It's good to know where you're starting because you can use that to monitor changes. And I would say that needs to be both near visual acuity as well as distance visual acuity. Uh, slit lamp biomicroscopy is a skill that many people are forgetting, and I think it's really important that every ophthalmologist that does good slit lamp examination. I like a 78 diopter lens for color. And um, just make notes about what you're seeing at baseline before you, you start your treatment. Um, and does photo help sometimes, especially when there's a lot of exudation? It's easy to explain to the patient what's going on. And I, I like especially red the images to show the images, microaneurysms and exudates. And if you're lucky and you have FFA, FFA is another useful tool. You know, look for the cystoid patterns and uh, the foveal hypofluorescence and stuff like that. So these are all things that can help, but I would say let's not forget the basic food visual acuity and good lamp examination. And then use what you have at baseline to monitor any response to treatment. I think that's sound advice, and uh, thank you very much to get us started on that. Keeping on with the th same theme of, of lack of resources, we had uh, two questions that came in, one from Myanmar, where the most unusual situation where there was no laser available, particularly at a secondary level, and the only option was the using of anti-VEGF. That was on one hand in this situation in Myanmar, and of course on the other where anti-VEGF is very expensive, uh, particularly in this situation from Kenya, and a laser was a mainstay, but again it's not widely available. Anthony, what has been your experience on this, and what is your uh, thoughts about uh, trying to tackle these two questions? Thank you very much. These are both good questions and are really at the heart of managing diabetic eye disease in low and middle income countries. I'll deal with the first situation first from Myanmar. Um, I think that the questions that I'd be asking there would be how far do patients have to travel uh, if they were to get laser somewhere else? Um, because if the laser is available not that far away, we need to remember that 
patients, even in, in well-resourced countries, don't often always return for their injections. And anti-VEGF injections, we need to remember, are a very regular thing. You're embarking on a, at least a two-year journey and often longer to bring diabetic maculopathy under control. So when you start using an anti-VEGF as your, your only option, um, you're going to have far more visits for that patient. That's going to load your services. And so it might actually be better to ask a patient to travel 50 kilometers for the laser, particularly if it's a proliferative disease, um, than it is to embark on uh, anti-VEGF treatment. But having said that, um, the, if, if the anti-VEGF is available, um, bear in mind the possible side effect of endophthalmitis. But if that's well managed and people are taught to do the injections well, then the DCR net studies, protocol uh, I and the RESTORE study, showed that actually anti-VEGF drugs were superior in treating maculopathy. So uh, you might actually, if you've got access to the anti-VEGFs, do, be doing your patients a service and get, getting a better visual outcome uh, for diabetic maculopathy. And then you can actually even treat proliferative disease with anti-VEGF drugs. The protocol S study showed us that, um, where they compared PRP with ranibizumab. Um, and on the whole, the, the injection group, the anti-VEGF group, had 33% more visits, about 10 injections a year. So again, there's that loading of your, your services. Um, but uh, the, at least half the PRP people went on and had anti-VEGF injections anyway because they developed macular edema. Uh, and at the end of the day, the, the, the protocol S people, the, the ones who were getting the injection, had slightly better outcomes in terms of vision and much less visual field loss and so on. So, um, yes, you can use it, is the short answer, but there, there, there are lots of um, uh, provisos there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, the question about the expense. Um, when I was working in Tanzania, we were able to access Avastin. Now, Avastin is much cheaper than Ranibizumab. Uh, or ILEA. And you can, if you can get hold of a vial, treat a patient for as little as $25 per injection. Again, you've got to mention, uh, remember that it's about 10 injections a year, so it's going to cost that patient mm -hmm. between $250 and $500 a year to be treated. Um, it is available in Kenya. You can get hold of a vial. And then the concerns are, well, what do we do about uh, a compounding pharmacy? Um, there was quite a good study published in the Clinical and Experimental Ophthalmology showing that um, the multiple withdrawal uh, from the vial, so multiple direct from vial dosing, uh, was safe. Um, they, they didn't have any episodes of infection and, and the rubber vial remained intact all the time. So uh, people could look at that and decide whether they want to do that th for themselves. Um, and, and then I think you've, you've got a, a, an option where you can give, give relatively cheap um, $25 versus $2,000 injections. Yeah, yeah. That leads us nicely into Professor Tunde's question that I have for you on lasers. Um, you know, one of the things that has come up over and over again is adherence to treatment and the challenge of costs and distance. And certainly the that have arisen is... Over how many sessions would you put in for a treatment for panretinal photocoagulation? And what are the challenges for a one-stop approach? And perhaps if, if uh, one-stop was used, what would be the conditions under which that could be undertaken? Particularly in, in areas where distance is a big issue and cost. These are all excellent questions. and, and even in the developed world, they struggle with it. I think we have to come back to the issue of well-done laser treatment and well-done PRP. A lot of people might not have had appropriate training on doing a very good and very appropriate PRP. And in those cases, people might be slightly afraid of, of, giving, uh, of putting lots of laser on or they are not comfortable enough to use the laser and, um, and they slightly under-treat. We do see this uh, from time to time. So I think one of our first principles have to be that if you commit to laser, do it well and do it properly. Cover the areas um, that you need to cover. If you, need, if you have very aggressive disease, come in to, to the, to the um, arcade and the optic disc. 
because laser is there to try to stop the disease and they're trying to save the vision left in the macula. You always have to consider if diabetic maculopathy might worsen, but you have to, we have to balance it against potentially losing the eye to neovascular glaucoma if the proliferative disease is particularly aggressive. I do tend to do two to three sessions if there is enough view. Unfortunately, still, even in the developed world, we have patients presenting with vitreous hemorrhage when you might not see the retina enough to do laser treatment. In those cases, you, need to, you might need to get the patient back. This is particularly difficult if they live far away and you have to do several extra sessions waiting for the vitreous hemorrhage to clear. Um, in, in those cases where I think that the patient isn't going to come back and the, or the patient says that it's impossible for me, we still do do occasionally a one-stop and, um, and we put on the, the, the amount of laser we need to put on and then try to live with the consequences. In, in, very, in, in proliferative disease, we always have to wait up against losing the patient and the patient coming back, back with a play, painful blind eye, right. which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, okay. Um, so following on from that, there was another question about how, what about lasering, laser treatments in, in women who is pregnant and has diabetic retinopathy? Any advice on that front? So I've been running the preg sorry, pregnancy in diabetes clinic for years now and uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland and also beforehand in, in the UK. And what we're finding is that patients still go uh, proliferative during pregnancy and this can be a fairly fast process. You might see them with just moderate disease one week and a few weeks later they have aggressive proliferative diabetic retinopathy especially if pregnancy type, if the diabetes just before pregnancy wasn't managed um, very appropriately and if they had to do a very quick tightening of the diabetes control. Although sometimes we don't really know why they have gone proliferative so quickly. So it does take longer. It does take a fair bit of um, um, effort both from the patient part and from the clinician's part but there is nothing out there that can save the site as well as a well done PRP in um, patients who are pregnant have diabetes and have just gone proliferative mm. it's one of those things that I honestly believe that there is nothing more tragic than going into your pregnancy fully sighted and coming out of your pregnancy without being able to see the baby and if you explain that to, to a pregnant lady, I, I had no issues with, with doing the actual laser treatment, but it does mean that you have to be very open about um, the, the length of the treatment, that they might be uncomfortable, that they might have to sort of sit back a few times. Okay, sound advice there. Um, I think in the, in the absence of um, uh, Consuela here, are you able to just throw your view on, on the idea of premature photocoagulation? And are there benefits of doing a PRP in moderate to severe cases of non-proliferative ER? Um, and in, you know, what are the, the, the influences on such a decision that you're likely to make? So we, historically, we have been lasering a lot of patients since at severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy stage. And even now, if, if a patient is a poor attender or if they are on, on dialysis and had, has had multiple amputations and had a stroke or a heart attack, and they, they wouldn't, I know that they are not able to come back regularly or if they are coming from a long distance, and knowing that they have high risk for progressing to proliferative disease, I really don't think that um, there is a problem with doing the photocoagulation earlier. 
because what you're doing is you're, you're stopping the disease from progressing to the point that you might lose the sight or the eye. Yeah. You do have to have a good conversation with the patient. They do need to understand that, that this isn't, strictly speaking, what the college the colleges tend to um, recommend, <clears throat> but there isn't anything wrong about looking at the back of the eye, seeing that it's extremely ischemic, lots of cotton wool spots, lots of um, interactional microvascular abnormalities, dot blood hemorrhages, high risk patient. We tend to then do prefer PRP. You might not bring it in as far as in a very, very uh, aggressive proliferative disease already established. But, but you, you treat the ischemic areas, you treat 360 degree, and you probably will get to the point that you don't have to see the patient every three to four months just to wait for that proliferation to occur. So that's, that's exactly where we would like to be, that the patients don't have to come as often. They only have to come for a, a rare follow-up. And then, of course, if diabetic macroedema hits, then we've got to rethink, but hopefully that takes years after the PRP, and then you have one a few years without having put the patient through so much expense and so much traveling. Mm. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Kim, that brings me into the next question that I want to uh, highlight about the, the, um, the lack of personnel in managing diabetic retinopathy was something that was, that was raised by many people a lack of trained personnel, and, and certainly um, what, what are the challenges that you're faced with and how are you managing that? And particularly, one of the key questions was, what about training allied eye health uh, providers uh, for taking on the task of anti-VEGF treatments? Thank you. Um, I think that's a very pertinent question, especially in countries like India, Africa, uh, where we have the problem uh, of personnel who are trained. Uh, we tend to use allied health personnel to the stage of where we can identify or screen the patients. Like we are using today, we are using people uh, in the diabetic clinics or the physicians, general physicians clinics. <coughs> to train the, uh, their nurse practitioner to take fundus photos and uh, send these patients. And these people are able to, over time, identify cases with diabetic retinopathy. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to managing these patients in India, we still have uh, a restriction on what they can do as far as the treatment part is concerned. Definitely not for laser or for injection, especially for injections. Uh, in uh, India, there's a lot of restriction that it has to be done only in the operating rooms, which is not the case in in uh, other countries, um, uh, the European countries, like developed countries. And I also know for sure many of the uh, European countries like Denmark and other places where they have the nurse practitioner to give injections, the intravitreal injections in the eye which I think uh, makes sense, especially in places like ours where we need to, uh, where we don't have the trained people to do, especially the number of cases that we have. Mm. It is, uh, we have a lot of papers with all the, how the uh, allied health personnel are able to give injections with less uh, side effects or, or, or uh, complications. So I think uh, it is important that we look at them as uh, the allied health personnel to provide anti of injections uh, because of the need, the numbers that are out there yeah. uh, in the community. Yeah, that is, that's an, uh, some important points to consider, particularly when you've got to also manage, man, manage the possibility of infections. Anthony, what about in your practice out in Australia? Are you also still relying on the ophthalmologist to do all the anti-VEGF Yes, so, Yeah, the, the, the rules in Australia are, are currently that uh, intravitreal injections must be given by an ophthalmologist. Um, 
the UK, and they're more uh, qualified people than me to answer this question at the moment, uh, has, has really led the way, I think, in developing nurse practitioner-led mm. services. And as Dr. Kim said, these have been shown to uh, be very safe. And uh, the well-trained nurses who have got good sterile technique um, do as good a job and the patients are, are very happy with it. So the the answer to that specific question is, can allied health workers be trained is an emphatic yes. Um, it will then depend on your local um, laws and and so on as to and guidelines from the colleges and ministries of health and so on as to whether you're allowed to put that in place. Do we see this likely to evolve as number of cases needing anti-VEGF increase over time? I think it, it may be forced to. Um, uh, obviously in Australia there's going to be resistance to it because so much of um, the uh, service is led by a fee-for-service, um, but I, I did over 30 injections myself today, and uh, it certainly would have been helpful to have somebody doing them for me. Yeah. Um, so, so going on from the practicalities of, of anti-VEGF delivery, um, cost, it, can we always come back to the cost of treatments? And one of the things that was raised is, are there any sort of uh, models of management support, uh, particularly cost management, for people who do need anti-VEGF treatments, particularly in uh, low and middle income country settings? Um, Dr. Kim, what is the model that's being used perhaps in Ireland, if you could explain? Yeah, uh, we do get a lot of those patients uh, uh, who need anti-VEGF injections. Fortunately, there's a lot of support from the government. Only in the recent times that supports these anti-VEGF injections uh, for the poor patients who cannot afford to have treatment. But then again, there's a cap on these uh, numbers that they can have uh, to a certain uh, amount of uh, money that can be uh, given by, supported by the government. But uh, institutions like Irwin, we try to raise money for supporting this, uh, uh, this kind of patients when they cannot afford to. But most of the time for Avastin, patients do try to find the money over time. And uh, we're able to manage uh, to make sure that no patient goes away without treatment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, but I'm not aware of any other models that are there, uh, you know, uh, that can support. Uh, because these is these are patients who we never know when they need when you need to stop treatment for them. Yeah. So it's a long term process, as Dr. Anthony mentioned. It's a long term. Yeah. So difficult it's, though. It's a I just have a question for him. I'd be interested to know how you actually manage the uh, division of the Avastin vial. Do you have a compounding pharmacy or do you do multiple puncture techniques there? Yeah, we have a compounding uh, center in, within the hospital which does the compounding for the Avastin injections. Earlier we were doing multiple injections, I mean multiple pricks from the same vial, but uh, uh, for the last few years we have a compounding pharmacy which does the alicorting for us. Mm. So that is the preferred option if people can manage it, mm. uh, but it does require a very good facility, doesn't it? Because I think the yeah. risk of poor compounding uh, <laughs> perhaps increases the risk of infection. When a practitioner is taking the responsibility of cleaning the vial with alcohol and povidone iodine themselves, uh, that may be a lower risk than a poor compounding pharmacy. Um, sure. Yeah, and I think the other comment would just be that in higher income countries, uh, there's a substantial reduction in the cost of an injection clinic when it's run by nurse practitioners. Mm. Um, I, I think in the UK you save something like £50,000 a year, don't you, when you um, yeah. engage nurse practitioners. So um, there, there are savings to be made at all levels. Yeah. Shiko, perhaps you could add to this conversation from your own experience. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, where I am, we, we do withdraw the Avastin from the same vial, and uh, we've so far been lucky. We have had no problems in, for the last five years. Uh, in terms of 
uh, cost of the injection, uh, we are lucky in this area of universal health coverage. In Rwanda, most people have, do have some form of medical insurance. And our role as ophthalmologists has been to negotiate with the government to make sure that as, as many of those treatments as possible get on the list of what's covered by all health uh, insurance policies. And uh, therefore, Avastin is pretty available even in the district hospital where there is personnel. Uh, what we do also is when we get, when we can negotiate better rates from uh, the, the suppliers of injections, uh, one thing that I've tried, especially for something like Lucentis, is if I get a reduction on cost, rather than keeping on changing my cost to the patient, I convert that to a free injection so i'll say you pay for two and the third one is free rather than telling them i've reduced the cost of this one injection because i'm more interested in them completing the entire treatment mm -hmm. um so i've tried that and it seems to work well people like it when you throw in a freebie uh and that that has helped uh, people comply more with the injections okay that's an in interesting idea buy two get one free I, 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 thank you for sharing that. Um, so certainly, you know, now that we're still on, on the topic of anti-VEGF, um, and, and of course laser treatment, one of the problems with adherence to treatment is fear. So how do you overcome that challenge uh, of, of uh, or how do you work, counsel the patient to, uh, to keep through to their treatment plan? Um, yes, it's true patients are pretty frightened and especially when you say an, an injection, they say is it outside the eye or inside the eye? And they say inside the eye, the second the injection fits inside my eye. So it's really something that frightens them a lot. Um, and uh, I, I do have long conversations in trying to explain that this is this is the latest treatment. This is a common treatment. It's happening all over the world. And uh, the fact that you don't have to get an, an injection for anesthesia, when I say you're just going to put drops in your eyes, that sort of calms their fears because they think if I'm only going to use a topical anesthetic, then it cannot be bad. And uh, I'll have a conversation after the injection and ask them, was it as bad as you thought? Because I know they need to come for another one. So I want to make sure that the, this experience was not as bad. Hmm. Um, so I think you do need to, to invest in that time to explain to the patient and, and uh, you know, acknowledge that it is a frightening thing. With laser, they, it's hard in my situation to even explain what a laser is and what it's going to do. So I will usually say I'm going to use a machine exactly like this one that I'm using to examine you, except that the type of light I'm going to use is different, and this one will treat your retina. And I, I tend to use the term it's a laser treatment rather than it's a burn or uh, things like that. And I do find that the, the language you use at the first uh, conversation makes a big difference in helping them overcome their fear. Yeah, yeah. yeah practical advice there. Dr. Kim, anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, I find that uh, among the patients, there's a myth here that if you have treatment, I mean laser treatment, you will lose your vision. So this is the word of mouth that gets spread among patients and so patients are more scared when you say laser. I see almost 20% of our patients disappearing either uh, even before the laser treatment is initiated or in between the laser treatment sittings. The other problem with the injection, it is easy to convince them and I mean they do undergo the uh, injection but the problem there is they drop off at some point of time in between uh, after two or three injections itself in spite of extensive counseling they drop off because one of either financial reasons or that they fear that there's nothing improving not much is happening so they kind of drop off so these are 
two different aspects for both laser and and DVHF. Yeah, yeah, um, and being being mindful of, of of that is important in the management of uh, for these cases. So I'd like to turn to the treatment of cataract, something that's kind of been the bread and butter of most uh, eye care units around the world, but. Now we're faced with um, a cataract treatment in a persons with diabetes. So perhaps let's tackle that first and say, what are your key tips, um, uh, Dr. Kim? Let's start with you on, on, on treatment of cataract in persons with diabetes. And then in the second scenario where you have done an eye screening and you have uh, picked up patients who have not been known to have diabetes, but they are picked up to have diabetes and cataract. So how are you managing in a high volume setting to manage these cases? Uh, the uh, cataract in a diabetic patient, uh, especially you have to make sure you're not dealing with any retinopathy or at least side-threatening retinopathy uh, uh, in the patients who have diabetes. So you either rule that out, once you rule it out, they are like any other uh, cataract patient, you operate on them and follow them more closely because they tend, they may develop signs of retinopathy, but usually with a good diabetic control, it's unlikely to happen. There are other studies which have shown some changes uh, post-cataract surgery for the diabetic patients, but they're not of significance. Whereas in patients with retinopathy, you have to make sure you discuss with the patient uh, ahead of time and you decide whether before the cataract surgery for the retinopathy, depending on the condition, whether he has maculopathy uh, or not. Sometimes we tend to do, if the patient has got uh, macular edema, we tend to treat with the injection first and then take these patients for cataract surgery. That's in the first cases. And then patients who have been diagnosed, uh, we, we manage unless he has got a very uncontrolled diabetes, he's got other problems like uh, renal disease and stuff, we tend to look at the metabolic control first before we take them for yeah. cataract surgery. Yeah. It's a, a holistic approach to that care. Yes. Uh, Anthony, can you add to that if you can hear it? Yes, I can hear you. Um, in in rural East Africa, fortunately, the uh, prevalence of diabetes is still quite low. Um, so it is important, obviously, to screen people for diabetes. But uh, on the whole, they tend not to have a lot of um, diabetic retinopathy. Um, in in patients where where there's a mature cataract and and you've you've taken the lens out and then you see they do have maculopathy uh, you then then have to act quite uh, quickly and aggressively i think because the diabetic the, the cataract surgery will have made it worse and so in that situation an injection of intravitreal um long-acting steroid would be appropriate mm -hmm. um, it would give quite long support and and su suppress the inflammation of the cataract surgery excellent um so, Anthony, just staying with you on the next question, which was on vitreo retinal surgery, which was actually felt that it was out of reach for many, many centers around the world, particularly due to the cost of the consumables and not to mention the training. What, what would you suggest in situations where you don't have somebody uh, with VR training and or facilities in place? Uh, well, obviously, if there's no one with the training and the facilities, then then you're not going to be able to do it. So um, this has to be planned well in advance. There are good fellowships available. The Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium has been uh, offering fellowships. There's excellent training in, in India and, and other places. And so people can get the training uh, and there is the support available for that. And you then have to do a lot of ad advocacy to get the commitment from um the university teaching hospitals, the government departments to support uh, that vitreoretinal surgery. And I think in terms of actually 
preventing blindness and, and curing people who have significant diabetic um, eye disease, such as vitreous hemorrhages, um, there, there is a cost benefit to that. Uh, once you've set up that um, service, then there are ways of reducing the costs of the consumables. And I'd be very interested to hear Dr. Kim's uh, input on what is done in India. Uh, what we did in Tanzania uh, is sterilization is paramount. You can't take shortcuts, um, you, but you, you can sterilize reusable instruments. So if you can source reusable instruments, uh, then you can reduce the cost of a cutter from, say, 145 euros um, per surgery to 14 euros per surgery. That yeah. you could use a cutter 10 or more times. Uh, but it must be a reusable, re-sterilizable cutter with the correct tubing. Um, ethylene oxide can be used, formaldehyde can be used, but there's staff safety issues with those that would need to be looked at, proper training and so on for those things. Uh, so th there are certainly ways of reducing the cost. You don't have to go the, the, the full cost of... Um, uh, uh, well-developed de economies, uh, once only uh, instrument use, I don't think, but you don't, shouldn't take shortcuts, you should do it properly. Okay. Yeah, uh, I agree with Anthony uh, on the cost. There's no shortcut to no training. There definitely, um, uh, we need a good training uh, facility and uh, unlike cataract surgery where you have different options of, you know, five dollar lenses to uh, three hundred or five hundred dollar lenses, it varies with the cost temporal cataract. Uh, in diabetic uh, or in these vitreous surgeries, there's no shortcut where you need to go through a complete use of uh, controllables. But what uh, is the difference that countries like India does is on reusing instruments and uh, uh, consumables that are possible like the vitreous cutters which are which we continue to use for four or five cases whereas uh, in developed countries it's like one time use and there's so many things that uh, you know we even the oil, uh, consumables like the silicon oil or the buffalo liquids when made locally we manufacture them locally and the cost of it has come down dramatically from what is available in the international market. So these have helped to bring the cost down. Uh, of course, the, the as Anthony pointed out, the risk of using the consumables have to be carefully looked at and how you monitor these consumables, especially the sterilization part, is very, very, very important. But before we go away, I'd love it if you were able to give the um, input from you. What's one takeaway message that we could end this hangout on? And maybe I'll start with you, and What would be your main take-home message? I think my take-home message is that people really need to be working on advocacy for people living with diabetes. Um, there's a, a critical need for people to have adequate access to treatment, and that includes the anti-VEGF drugs and the lasers. There aren't enough lasers in Africa, there isn't enough access to anti-VEGF, and I'm sure there are lots of other places in the world. And the key issue there is advocacy. So we need to be getting out there and saying, look, our patients do have retinopathy, it needs treatment, and we need access to these things. Excellent. Sheku, we lost you for a bit, but glad to have you back. <laughs> Thank you, Dacha. Um, yes, I, I completely agree with what Anthony says. Uh, in addition to that, I, I always worry that as, as diabetic retinopathy treatment becomes almost trendy, we don't end up repeating the cycle that we did in cataract, where we end up with really bad treatment outcomes because we are dishing out lasers and injections everywhere. So I hope that the, the issue of quality treatment will be at the forefront everywhere, including in my part of the world, and that when we, when we give someone a laser, we ensure that they have the appropriate training to use it. When we do decide who should give infections, everything is being taken control of from the septis to the storage of the injections, and I, I just don't want us to repeat that cycle of realizing, oh, we need to take care of the outcomes as 
usually with DR, we will not get a second chance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Dr. Kim? Yeah, I agree with that. We echo on the advocacy part. The, uh, another thing that I stress on is the metabolic control of diabetes because that's something very often patients, uh, I mean, we as ophthalmologists leave it to the uh, physicians. Somehow that is not balanced. So it's very important that patients understand the need to have a good diabetic control during this entire process of diabetic retinopathy management. Mm. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for your input today on this Google Hangout and, and for your advice that you've given. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Saksha.